welcome back to Danny B Talks for the 15th installment of one of my most popular series, Five NASCAR Drivers You Forgot About. It's been a little bit since our last one, so I figured we could dive back into the information available online of five more drivers who you may have forgot about. So without any more delay, let's begin. Nick Drake Nick is just a little bit younger than myself, born on December 22nd, 1995, and he grew up in racing country in Mooresville, North Carolina. But his time in NASCAR was rather brief, but at one point, he had some top connections supporting him after starting out in the lower levels of racing, and by 2014, he was competing for Bill McAnally Racing in the K&N Series in both the Eastern and the Western Divisions, but primarily in the Eastern Series, driving number 15, Napa Toyota. In 2014, Drake would record one pole award at Richmond, and he would score eight top tens of four top five finishes to go on to finish 10th in the K&N East Series standings. Drake would also compete in both K&N West races in 2014 for Bill McAnally, first in the 55 and then number 99, where he'd finish third in the first one and then he would win the second race from the pole position. Then for 2015, he was back full-time in McAnally's number 15 Toyota, where he'd score seven top tens and two top fives, finishing the season eighth in the season standings. Afterwards, in 2016, Drake would make just two starts in the Camping World Truck Series for Junior Motorsports number 49, Haas Automation Chevy Silverado, once at Dover and a second time at Iowa, but did not perform as well as anticipated with a best finish of 16th. After this run in the trucks, Drake left the world of NASCAR and upon finding his profile on Facebook, it looks as though Nick has gotten into the world of sprint car racing. <laughs> Jimmy Vassar Jimmy Vassar is a well-known fixture in the world of IndyCar, CART, and USAC racing. Vassar was a key member over in CART during the time when IndyCar and CART were split, but he would later go on to at least race in IndyCar sparingly in five Indy 500s in the 2000s. Over 15 seasons, Vassar would make 232 starts in CART, where he'd pick up a total of 10 wins, 33 podium finishes, and 8 pole awards. His best years were arguably between 1996 and 1998, racing for Chip Ganassi, who he'd scored a majority of his victories for, and in 1996, he would win the CART Series Championship. He'd also compete in two seasons of IROC, scoring a total of six top tens and two top fives during his time there. With all of the successes he brought in from the world of open wheel racing, how was he on this list? Well, back in 2003, he tried his hand at NASCAR two times in the Bush Series for Todd Bronze number 30, once at Daytona where he'd qualify fifth but would go on to finish 28th after being collected in a crash, and then he'd make one start at the Milwaukee Mile in which he would qualify 32nd but persist to finish 25th. Jason Keller. This next guy should probably be well known to a lot of diehard NASCAR fans, but perhaps not as much to some of the newer and more casual fans of NASCAR, as Jason Keller was primarily a star in the Xfinity series. Keller was born and raised in Greenville, South Carolina, as the entire comment section begins to look over at Slap Shoes, where Keller would start racing on go-kart tracks, before working his way up to late model sportsman dirt track racing by the age of 16. By 1991, he had reached his Bush Series debut. In the 1991 race in May at Lanier Speedway, driving number 54, Air Products Buick, which he'd go on to finish 29th in after starting in 8th. Air Products would go on to be a great supporter of the Keller family racing team from 1991 to 1994, as Jason would race in number 54 and number 45 in various races, but would eventually line up in the number 57, which he would drive until the end of 2003. In February of 1993 at Rockingham, Keller would get his first ever top 10, and then the next year in 1994, he'd get his first ever top 5 at Dover in his first full-time season. On top of that, he'd also scored three pole awards that season, the first of his career, and in 1995, Keller picked up Budget Gourmet to be his primary sponsor, and it would prove to be a great season, finishing fourth in 1995, going on to pick up his first career victory at Indianapolis Raceway Park with six top fives and 12 top tens on top of this. From that point on, things continued to get better and better for Keller, with Slim Jim coming on board as a sponsor for the team, and once again, another top 10 season finish. 1997 and 1998, however, would be considered a downgrade for Keller, finishing in the mid-teens in the standings, running without a sponsor, and this would force the Keller family team to sell out to the new team of PPC Racing. This move would suit well for Keller as they'd sign on a new sponsor, IGA, and they would proceed to win three pole awards, 12 top 10s, five top fives, and two victories, finishing eighth in the season standings. And from this point on until 2003, Keller ran very strong, getting seven wins, four pole awards, 80 top 10s, 54 top fives, and he would finish second, third, second, and fifth in the Bush Series standings between these four seasons in what was quite frankly the peak of Keller's career. In 2003, he'd also make two Cup Series starts, once as a relief driver for the injured Jerry Nadu in the 01 Army Pontiac at Richmond, and once in the number one car for DEI at the Fall Talladega race. 
After 2003, the team lost their sponsor, but Miller Brewing actually came in with Miller High Life to be the sponsor of the team, changing the team's number to the number 22 as well. And although he would not win, he would produce 6 top 5s and 12 top 10s, resulting in a 6th place season finish. But Miller would leave after 2004, and without a sponsor, Keller would also leave PPC Racing in order to join Team Renzi Motorsports with McDonald's on board as a sponsor. Despite finishing 9th in 2005, Keller struggled that season, having just one top 5 at Talladega and only 6 top 10s. That just says a lot about just how many Cup Series drivers were running almost full time in the Bush Series at that time. Then in 2006, he originally went to race the number 1 for Phoenix Racing, owned by James Finch, and was running fairly decent, hanging around 12th in the standings, but on April 18th, 2006, Keller was released by Phoenix Racing in what most would call a cheap shot by Finch in favor of Mike Wallace. After this, Keller would fail to qualify in Frank Cece's number 34 at Richmond, and afterwards, he would decline future opportunities with the team. Afterwards, Bruco Motorsports would give Keller the opportunity to practice and qualify number 66 Ford when Greg Biffle would be busy with his Cup Series program on select race weekends. Keller did so well during this that the team competed with Keller for him to make his 400th career start at Indianapolis Raceway Park, where he'd finished 15th after running in the top 5 most of the day. After 2006, Keller would continue to race for various teams until 2010, where after a less than stellar run of TriStar Motorsports, he'd step away from NASCAR racing. I'd also love to point out that Keller would surpass Tommy Houston's record at the most Bush Series starts in 2007 when he surpassed 418 starts, going on to make a total of 519 starts, and he he would keep this record until 2011 when Kenny Wallace would take over the record from him by making his 520th start in a nationwide series. <laughs> Kyle Krisiloff at one point, Kyle Krisiloff had the makings to be a future star of NASCAR, starting out in the world of Supercars USA competition before moving up to SCCA Formula Ford competition where he'd win six races, record six pole awards, and win a 2001 national championship at the SCCA runoffs, becoming the youngest to ever do so at the age of just 14. Then in 2002 and 2003, he competed in Toyota Atlantics and he'd become the youngest driver in the history of the series to score a podium when he finished second at the Milwaukee Mile. So then 2004 brought in a new opportunity for Krisiloff when he became a development driver for Hendrick Motorsports. During 2004, Krisiloff competed in 10 ASA races in addition to 3 ARCA races backed by Hendrick Equipment with Bobby Gerhardt Racing. He did rather well in his first 3 races in ARCA, finishing 9th in his debut race at Lake Erie Speedway, then 2nd at Nashville Super Speedway, and then he would score his first ARCA win at Chicagoland. Then in 2005, he competed in 14 ARCA races of Bobby Gerhardt's team, scoring 2 pole awards, 3 top 5s, and 5 top 10s, and then he would also make three starts in Rick Hendrick's number five car in the Bush series, but he would not do well having an average finish of 33.7, and subsequently he was released from his development contract with Hendrick at the end of the 2005 season. And then he would go on to compete for Billy Baloo Motorsports number 15 truck, but would be forced to part ways after the first 12 races due to financial issues, but during those 12 races he did struggle having an average finish of 24th. After 2006, he got a full-time opportunity to drive the number 14 Ford Fusion in 2007 when the team of Carl Haas, Travis Carter, Marie Holman George, and Michael T. Lanigan bought out PPC Racing. The team had funding from Clabber Girl, a brand under the Holman George family company, but they would also sign on Walgreens as well as Eli Lilly and Company's pharmaceutical company as sponsors. However, Krisiloff was still unable to perform well, scoring only two top tens in the 35 race season with a sixth place finish at Montreal and a fifth place finish at Talladega. Then finally in 2008, he'd make just one ARCA start in Bobby Gerhardt's number seven at Daytona, but would finish in 38 place after being collected in a crash. And then he went on to make just 6 starts for Chip Ganassi in the 41 Bush Series car, but his best finish was just 24th, and after this, he would step away from NASCAR as a driver. But he would still work in motorsports according to LinkedIn, as he worked for more than 5 years of IndyCar from 2010 to 2015 in various positions, and today, he is the Senior Director of Music and Entertainment at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, where he's been since October of 2015. <laughs> Amber Cope Originally, both Amber and her sister, Angela Cope, today known as Angela Ruck, were slated to one day make it on this series, but thanks to Twitter, Barstool Sports, and her husband, Mike Ruck, along with their reality show, The Ruck Life, I believe it's safe to say we all will never be able to forget Angela Ruck now, even if it's not for a great reason, but perhaps we have forgotten about her twin sister, Amber. The Cope twins entered the racing world together at the age of nine in go-karts, where they both did really well at such a young age, capturing pole awards and winning races year after year, 
and by the age of 15, Amber and Angela moved up to racing late models. It did help the twins' career a good amount, having the uncle that they did, because he was none other than Cup Series veteran Derek Cope. By 2008, the Cope twins had made it to ARCA, and Amber, driving a number 70 owned by her uncle Derek, made two starts that year, one at Kentucky finishing 38 after being involved in a crash, and the other at Chicagoland finishing 29. In 2009, she'd attempt three races with different teams, but would only qualify for one race at Toledo, where she would finish 27th. In October of 2010, Amber and her sister would become the first set of twins to race in the same race in NASCAR's National Series by both starting in the 2010 Kroger 200 at Martinsville Speedway, in which Amber would finish 26th and Angela would finish 30th. After that, Amber would make one nationwide series start in 2011 at Iowa, which she would not finish all of the laps, and according to Racing Reference, her status at the end of the race was listed as too slow. Then in 2012, it wouldn't be just NASCAR and Racing Reference who were saying that, as Kevin Harvick was very vocal towards Amber Cope after the FW Web 200 at New Hampshire when her car held him up while in the lead and gave the win over to Brad Keselowski and his response to this was that she should go find a new job. Well, that's exactly what happened after 2012 because Amber Cope would never make another start in NASCAR and neither would Sister Angela until resurrecting herself in 2017 under her new married name, Angela Ruck. And of course, none of us have been able to forget her now and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is up to the fans to decide. And that'll do it for another edition of 5 NASCAR Drivers You Forgot About. Thanks for watching, and please remember to leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it. It really does help my channel out a lot and continue to grow and spread new content out to others. Have suggestions for future names in this series? Drop a comment down below and maybe it'll end up in an episode. If you're new here or if you just haven't done so yet, please hit subscribe and turn on notifications so that you'll never miss a new video. And you can follow me on Twitter over at DannyBTalks. I say rather active there as well. Thanks once again for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Bye, guys.